Welcome to this week's uh, seminar in Mix and Politics, where we are welcoming Calypso Nico Nicolai Dais from uh, the University of Ox Oxford, where she is a professor of Asian history. She's, uh, uh, sorry, international relation. <laughs> My head went in spin there. She's also a fellow at St. Anthony College at the European Studies Centre and a funding member of the Spinelli Group. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's today going to talk to us about how to make ancient myth matter in, in, the mod in modern politics. So over to you, Calypso. Thank you so much, Thomas and Maria. Indeed, uh, I am not a professor of ancient Greece, although I'm here in Greece and greeting everyone. Thank you for being from around the world with us. Uh, I have to say that um, it's been a great pleasure for me to be an interloper in this classicist um, seminar. We were just saying, Thomas and Maria, how it was, it's been quite interdisciplinary, but I must say that I feel like um, most from an outsider looking in, um, as someone who indeed uh, understands that it's not original to ask how classics, you know, matter so much for our presence. We all know that. And indeed, um, it's been fascinating to hear most, of, I think I heard most of the talks in the seminar, um, which all somehow touch on this theme of uh, somehow we all take part in retelling the old stories, you know, from Olivia, who told us about the goddess devotees and the spiritual inspiration they get from the ancients for the present to, you know, all the way to last time, Melissa telling us this really fun Doctor Who story about audience, uh, semiotic understanding of our audience interpretation, all the way through Maria, who I love many things, but including uh, the moment when the storytellers need to be killed so that memory can be killed. So all of these stories truly um, I found fascinating and, and inspiring for my own quest. Now, how does someone like me who teaches international relations theory and normative, you know, IR and philosophy, you know, come to ask this question? Um, well, let me just simply say in, in a nutshell that as an international relations person, I do like to look at a lot of IR issues upside down you know, asking how the rest of the world, the post-colonial, sees, you know, us in the West, how we can um, rethink balance of power from the point of view of checks and balance between peoples. And indeed, how, at the end of the day, democracy works across countries. So, um, in one of my big interests that led me from IR, from international relations, to this question of how can we enhance our democratic conversation across border, transnationally? In fact, I've even developed this whole theory of democracy, um, which I'm not going to talk about here. Uh, but I did allow myself as partly Greek uh, neologism in IR with democracy. And, um, and this a quest about uh, the, the, the question of how countries relate and, and need to anchor their relationship uh, in the people, you know, it's an old Kantian idea that we revisit, you know, all the time. And of course, that leads us to uh, this moment for me, I think for many of us, uh, in 2016 of Brexit, when, um, like many scholars of the European Union, not only was I uh, challenged as a, as a citizen, but of course, as a scholar. And, and, and in the first few weeks and months of, of, of all these debates, um, I mean, clearly to me, I, I was starting to write and think, you know, mostly knowing we couldn't stop it, but how can we have a change UK and change Europe, which maybe our children will return to the EU. And, but above all, how can we imagine a, a better, smarter, kinder Brexit? I, I started to hate all this macho talk on both sides, and which we, to this day, are, have been witnessing. And as I started to think along these lines, um, I found myself in the, uh, in the position of Rorty's, you know, liberal ironist, who faces up to the contingency of her beliefs and desires, as I put it here, and, and where my vocabulary, it, it was really inadequate, my political science vocabulary, because everything I was seeing and thinking was about doubt. 
And, and so for, I can't really explain how, but somehow as I was, um, I'm just trying to show you. Yeah. Um, well, in the process of asking these questions, I also went from being Franco uh, Greek to being Franco Greek British, <laughs> um, and indeed in targeting my, my multiple identities. And somehow in, in all of this process, um, I came back to my own somehow upbringing and um, love for Greek mythology. Um, first, as someone who um, was raised by a Greek dad in Paris because he was in exile during the dictatorship and he was speaking Greek mythology to my brother and I all the time so that we wouldn't forget uh, that where we came from. Um, and indeed, as with the name like mine, I did spend my youth, my life, um, explaining to people who was this semi-goddess and did she force Ulysses in her island or did, did he want to stay and did he want to go? And, and a lot of that um, kind of lived experience of mythology um, didn't make me a classicist, obviously. Uh, I am just a very superficial consumer of Greek mythology. But it did give me this strong sense that basically myth is up to our imagination. You know, we, we put in them whatever we want and kind of serves our purpose today. Or at least that was my own personal, you know, experience. Um, and this is how I came to interrogate Brexit, really very quickly as summer 2016 all these images of mythology came to my mind and kept on prepping back from the british trojan horse in europe you know oh well good riddance you know before he really puts our cities on, on, in fire on the continent to you know the, the the brits having answered the call of the sirens and having untied themselves from the masts of the eu you know all the way to here is our Ulysses, you know, uh, between Charybdis and Scylla. Um, and, and indeed, you know, Britain from Fort Theresa May, from hard remainers to hard Brexiters, can, she come, can we find a way through and survive as a nation? And, you know, well, not really, because you're going to face unicorns and all of that. And, and seeing that actually this theme was really about this back and forth between yearning for fusion and fission. Um, and indeed in Greek mythology, do I, I started explaining to my students and around, you know, you have this uh, fusion and fusion, fission all the time, you know, fusion, the, the yearning for oneness of Plato's and, and be, um, um, the, the, <clears throat> Um, ambivalent being to uh, to the fission, of course, the very beginning, the crisis of the at the beginning of the Iliad, where it's all about sharing, sharing of women as always, and and the fission of war, and all of these themes that somehow echoed in our political debates. So, um, in a nutshell. I ended up in two years from then from the beginning. Uh, producing this book, um, Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice, Three Meanings of Brexit, which reads the Brexit debates through the lens of myth, of archetypal myth. And indeed, in fact, the whole point of the book is to say, you know, can we have a better democratic conversation in a different way about Brexit? And this is also why it was through a publisher Unbound that was crowdfunding its books, that crowdfunds to this day its books, a normal publisher, but through crowdfunding. And I'll, I'll come back in a minute rather quickly on the book, but I was a bit insecure, you know, with this book and I sent it to Richard Buxton and he, um, I'm very, I was very proud that he endorsed the book and that was a great pleasure for me. Um, and and so uh, the book, in in some to some extent, um, is part of a has become part of a bigger story, where um, I'm trying to connect you know, IR political science philosophy with classics and classical reception, both from an epistemic viewpoint, better understanding, but also incre increasingly this is a performative project. Um, and these days I'm working with uh, colleagues in, in Oxford um, 
we, which or who organized something called the IF Festival, which tries to bring social sciences to a broader public through different means. And in fact, we're also experimenting doing it virtually. Um, and and part of this experiment that I want I will come to at, at the end of this talk um, is about conveying hardcore political theory through um, through the telling of myth. And I have to say and confess that I have been I've had the huge pleasure in this adventure to uh, to get to know my colleagues uh, who work in this in the classic reception. Uh, department Greek and Roman uh, re reception, my wonderful colleague Fiona, Fiona McIntosh, and of course this whole enterprise being created 25 years ago by Edith Hall and, and all of their team over there. I was just discussing with Maria the fact that, well, yes, Oxford, like other places, we now we have colleges and we can talk with each other, but departments don't necessarily, in my view, you know, work together enough to that extent. So we're starting to work together and that, that's part of the adventure. But today I'd like to give you a sense of, you know, the book and the themes that I'm working on, but really to pick your brains. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, utilitarian here because it's totally an experiment. And I wanna, I'd like to hear from you, you know, um, how you think that works, whether it works, other experiments of such kinds, etc. So to come back then to the um, to the to the theme, so of course I don't need to convince you why use ancient archetypal myth to read politics, but I want to tell you how I explain it. You know, when I speak about my book or about what I'm doing from IR to to with with myth, the reasons I'm giving because you know I'm sure you find this too, and I don't think we've discussed this in previously in the seminar, but of course when we when we speak of myth and in fact mythomania, you know in the Brexit context, you know you say I'm going to tell you about myth and politics. People think this, you know, uh, the great myth mythologies around lies or falsehoods around you know the history. Um, that has led to Brexit or the perception of history, the historical um, uh, Henry VIII and Napoleon and Wellington and the image of Britain and, and all of that. And so you first have to explain that, you know, no, 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 this is not what we mean by myth. And of course, there are about 15 novels, you know, that kind of build on these myths that were written in the 10 years leading up to Brexit, which is also fascinating. Um, and they're all they're all thrillers based on these historical myth and the, the David and Goliath and the, and the inheritance and all of that. And that's not what we're talking about, right? And of course, Melissa last time alluded to Roland Barthes and the whole kind of semiotic of mythology, reading myth in bourgeois societies. And, and indeed, that's that kind of a bridge to what we want to talk about today. Uh, because indeed, um, the idea, the Barton idea of mythology is indeed how societies build up archetypes to, under, to um, sell stuff in the capitalist society or whatever. Now, what we're talking about, though, is a different story. Because why myth? Well, I mean, we know very well that there is a very long tradition of democratic appropriation of mythology. Um, and indeed, um, I was at the Theatre Avignon Festival last summer, and it was fascinating. Some of you might have been there. Um, the theme was Ulysses, not original, but fantastically appropriated by, you know, young for the, from the suburbs, prisoners, and everybody read their own story in Ulysses. And of course, there was the wonderful play, uh, um, Le Présent qui déborde, by this wonderful um, uh, Brazilian um, director, Daharti, who um, uses, quote on, quote, you know, refugees from around the world in a mix of theater and play. And I saw the play in Brussels with my brother, and, and this was fantastically, you know, intense. Be I don't need to describe this to you. We, we've all experienced this, this, this. And, and, and indeed, I was also in Ireland. 
of course, a great tradition of appropriating drama, well, here in the Americas. Uh, my colleague, Fiona McIntosh, has written beautifully about, about the Greek-Irish twinning and the cultural conquest of England by the Irish through Greek tragedy, you know, by the end of the 19th century. And as echoed currently a lot in the... Um, in, in novels and um, many, many productions, inspiring a certain, and of course Antigone is foremost in this story, um, is inspiring a, a certain politics, of course, of resistance. And to this day, I mean, I just found this, this group of students, you know, working on Antigone. Does it ever stop to in, in inspire adolescents? I don't think so. But of course, uh, when we ask why myth, and we, we see, uh, you know, storytelling um, very, I mean, these days between Stephen Fry and Natalie Haynes, you know, there is this huge pent up demand for mythology. Um, but what is interesting, of course, is that there is a lot of anamnesis in this story. Um, somehow people hear what they didn't remember that they knew. And, um, and the question is, when you remind people, well, what were these stories really about? Um, I, I, you get to ask, can they constitute, as you remind the people of these stories, a shared language, a vocabulary, but not some age-old wisdom. And that's a, really something important for us, I think, that is very pregnant in everything we've heard in the seminar. This is not about the age-old wisdom, but really rather about paradoxes, contingent meanings, ambiguous message, really question marks all the time. And moreover, as we tell and retell and listen and reimagine re these myths, to a great extent, we are telling ourselves that we're listening with the ironic stance of modernity. Doesn't mean we're not taking them seriously, but we are in a different uh, era, obviously. And so the question is, when can we subvert the text with our modernity? What can we just do whatever we want for our own purposes? Yet looking for, you know, what I am most interested in, a demarche of mutual recognition of experience. Uh, in my own work, I, 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 um, I've, I've done a lot on mutual recognition, including in working on mutual perception between Greeks and Germans, the mutual recognition lost. Um, where you find, I'm sure um, this is something that amuses many of you, you know, how the Germans, you know, in the Greek, uh, Greek crisis, uh, the financial crisis, found uh, themselves to really believe that there are more Greeks than the Greeks. They're more faithful to the ancients. After all, they invented, you know, white Greece in the late 19th century. And these lowly Greeks today, they're just not up to the task of keeping Greek, ancient Greece present today. Anyway, that was a lot of part of the subtext in the financial crisis management that I found fascinating with my co-authors. But coming back then to why myth, um, in at different moments, one finds that myths are about an ontology. You know, it, it's, it's, and as I think Melissa was saying, several of us were saying, how do we convey, you know, the question of agency uh, about of myth, and which is something, of course, that, that that is so important. The realities that are so often inevitable and yet so absolutely surprising. So you know, a lot of politics is about the choices we still have, even as we read the writing on the wall. Doesn't Oedipus still have a choice? And of course, a part of what we're doing here in interrogating myth is a critique. You know, we're, we're taking part in a very old debate, obviously. Uh, and, and that debate, of course, we all know started with Plato, who, <laughs> a bit hypocritically, right? I mean, you know, rejects mythos for logos. He starts the whole modern philosophy. And yet, of course, uh, his Republican writing is full of myth to convey the stories, including the ending with the myth of air. What is he? What is he? What is his relationship to myth? And of course, then we find Nietzsche and Herkimer and Adorno. You know, Oxford, we have a, a, a wonderful student, Ayyubum, who is exploring this myth, this Platonic myth, mythic tradition um, um, in, in political philosophy. And so, so here we are just talking about this open endedness of myth. 
that allows us to reinvent them. And, and with Brexit, I was doing a philosophy of separation, trying to use myth to develop that philosophy. So that's kind of part of the story of why myth. Um, adding to this, um, in fact, more recently in Oxford, we have been working with, um, with the uh, EU and various groups on, on a, a whole big project on understanding our political nature. Um, how we can be, use our social psychological understanding to do better politics and decision making. And in this story, of course, narratives and framing are very, very important. And myth, are, of course, are part of how we understand we, how we do narratives and framing. Uh, yeah, this is a picture of the same meeting with the very different photos that gave different framing of what actually happened in the EU. So coming back to the book then, uh, with this kind of uh, in idea in the background, let me just you know spend five minutes giving you a sense of what I did in this book, and then a bit more time telling you about the themes that I extracted from the book and that are that I'm pursuing now in a performative way. So in the book. Um, I am interested in the word and in the meaning of the word. Brexit means Brexit, not the meaning of meaning. What does mean mean in Brexit mean Brexit? And indeed, I developed these three archetypes. Um, this is a painting by my son that tries to show the three archetypes. And the first archetype is, is quite obvious. Brexit as exodus, the shackled people leaving for the for, for, promised land. And here you have this very straightforward means, meaning of Brexit that will we'll leave the EU, just like all the peoples who have been in an exodus. Now, of course, when we say exodus these days, and we think of refugees and, and terrible exodus, this is a very different metaphor. But the metaphor is there everywhere in, in, um, in the Brexit story. And of course, as I tell this um, story, and this is of course the biblical myth, but I will then use Greek myth to illustrate it. I always have but immediately. There is a simple myth and then there is the but. And of course the bond is that, what kind of bond are we talking about? Bondage of the bonds that, that, that bind. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's a leap of faith. <laughs> will the sea open? Um, but before that, what will happen when you're lost in transition? And what is this promised land? And indeed, um, what Europe are we leaving? And I'll come back to Europa because that's part of the myth too. What is it that Europe that we're leaving? Um, and so that's the first story. The second story is very different. And it's a story we also heard again and again in the Brexit debate, which is Brexit as reckoning. Uh, it's not about anymore about Britain leaving. It's this whole continent reckoning with its sins. It's, it's it, what it's done to its peoples in Britain and all everywhere, Europe, Europe as reckoning. Um, and there, of course, there the meaning is Brexit means maybe everyone should leave. Maybe we should give up the project altogether. Um, and, uh, but here's the, the problem, you know, in reckoning, in Oedipus's reckoning, what truth, which, whose truth are we talking about? What is really wrong with the project, with the politics? Why are people saying no? And of course, it's not just the Brits. And it's not just the fault of, you know, Trump or Syria. But what truth is it? And of course, who talks about the consequence, you know? Um, because of course the Europeans kept on telling the Brits, you know, Brexit has consequences. You will see the consequences. Um, and of course th that's because both sides everywhere, the elites, you know, failed to acknowledge blindingly obvious truth. They only saw the truth when they poked their eyes out. Um, but nevertheless, what we know from Greek mythology is that there are always consequences and it takes a long time to interpret um, what is the reckoning about? Why does the Odyssey follow the Iliad? Why is impossible voyage of return? Well, hey guys, you know, you burnt a city and raped these women and killed the kids. You know, what, what else do you expect? The gods don't like it or your conscience doesn't like it. But who dictates the consequence? 
And then, of course, there is the question of hubris. You know, there is hubris in this story, maybe in Britain, maybe elsewhere. But who is to blame at the end of the day? And of course, yes, it may be this politician, that politician. Maybe there is agency in the system, but maybe it's the structure of the system. Maybe it's capitalism itself. And my dear friend Albina Zmanova, you know, just produced this wonderful book where, of course, it's the, the hubristic system itself um, and the Sisyphus of capitalism that we need to look to. Uh, and of course, again, echoes of the British German story. And when we ask, um, because in the book, I also ask where to go, where to look for answers. Uh, this is where also myth is so useful because at the end of the day, reckoning, well, is about the afterlife. And in the myth of air, you learn what the kind of, the kind of virtues can help break the cycle of reward and punishment that Plato is after. So, so this is the very quick second way. And then my third story is again, very different. Maybe Brexit is a new beginning. Maybe it's not, it's not about reckoning. Maybe it's the sacrifice, just like Iphigenia's sacrifice. You know, it's a sacrifice of Britain on the altar of Europe. And here Brexit means that the UK will leave the EU in order to save it. And it's like with every sacrifice, you know, you sacrifice yourself for another cause. And it was said a lot, even by the Brexiters and, and by the Europeans, hey, Britain, leave us so we can do our thing. And of course, there's a lot of buts in this story, and I give you just a few bullet points. First of all, that, of course, uh, we know that scapegoats uh, um, are about being saved, or are they? You know, will Iphigenia be dead or alive? Um, and, and indeed, what is this sacrifice for? Is it on the altar of EU principles, unity? Who, um, or maybe much more optimistically, is it a self-reflective sacrifice? Um, and here I give you this really, um, I love this two paintings because this was Klimt, you know, positing himself as Theseus and the Minotaur. Uh, himself and his friends against the powers that be, um, trying to, after all, Theseus um, uh, kills uh, the, the one that is always looking, uh, is always embodying sacrifice. And of course, the first version, the first poster was censored. And so you have the second one, which is the official one. Um, hey, we're, we are, you know, more than a hundred years ago. But this was always very present, Theseus, uh, and, and the self-reflectiveness of sacrifice, because Theseus is the one that actually, let's remember, in fact, ends all sacrifice uh, in ancient Greece. He symbolizes this self-reflectiveness of Greeks, of what's wrong with this whole idea of sacrificing you know, beautiful young people and all that. Um, and so, so you ask lots of questions about sacrifice, and indeed, uh, if, the, if the scapegoat doesn't die, because in this story, it's not the EU as usual that is, you know, the scapegoat, but it's Britain. Um, and if it's not, doesn't die, what will, will it be rehabilitated or forgotten or will it really die? But in the end, I do believe that there is something else going on here, which is a demonstrative sacrifice, where Brexit meant that you can leave and therefore you shouldn't. And because, wow, the EU is, um, is, a, is not a prison. You're free. You have political agency. And so if you're allowed to leave, maybe you shouldn't. And well, that's not what Ulysses some, somehow figured out with Calypso when she gave him the choice, but that's kind of too bad. There we go. Um, maybe he had uh, a very good reason. Now, that's kind of in a very quick nutshell, the book. But in the time that remains uh, today, what I want to kind of share with you is um, the themes that kind of have emerged in the last few years for me, where um, a certain understanding and subversion of mythology allows me to enter the conversation in a different way. Um, and, and where I am now is that um, I'm interested in how you can bring performance um, and the conversation together. 
in fact, I did this talk in, in Ireland, talk, where I was experimenting with asking the audience to kind of be uh, the chorus. And, and that's one big theme that I'm investigating these days is how do you improvise spontaneously a chorus attitude from a performance that might or might not be you know, familiar with, um, with what a chorus is, a, a chorus telling you what has happened, echoing the story, resisting, taking sides, pushing the characters, not to be hypocritical, truth tellers. Now, what is a chorus? And can you be a chorus as a reader, as an audience? Can you have the stance of the chorus? So that's what I want to provoke my students and other audiences with. And so here are, you know, very quickly four themes um, that I am using this for. Uh, and this was, this was a provocation, but um, so the theme one is the paper that I sent you, Maria, you were um, talking about the paper in a, in a moment ago. Uh, yeah, it's published in France and, and I'm still working on this, but basically, isn't it obvious when we listen to the debates and what's going on with the coronavirus and this pandemic, that there's a very thin line between everybody's hyper-legitimate yearning to really understand cause and effects from the scientists who, uh, who try, have to mix all the disciplines from epidemiology to how societies work and politics and everything together. How do we come, why are the curves the way they are? And of course, the people, democracy tries to understand, in fact, appropriate the R, you know, the reproduction rate. I mean, it's becoming this kind of democratic search for cause and effect. And at the same time, and that's totally legitimate, right? That's what we want to do. We, but at the same time, of course, let's cut all this bullshit and try to find one actor to blame. And of course, it's very easy to blame China, maybe not entirely wrong. When what about all the Chinese people who walk in the street and get assaulted? But what about the carriers, you know, refugees and migrants coming from the outside? Ooh, they're going to be to blame. But you will see, and that's the question we need to ask, who's going to be, who's going to be blamed next in the next few months and years? You know, maybe the young people will be blamed because, hey, they, they weren't that careful because they were asymptomatic. Maybe old people will be blamed because, well, they didn't, they didn't sacrifice themselves, so they killed the economy. Um, Etc. Oh, of course, Trump has found many to blame, you know, populist. So the blame game is all over the place, of course, with Oedipus, with the virus. And this is why, of course, we need for me to re, you know, educate ourselves and think very, very hard about how we make scapegoats, how we have in history, how we have gone beyond making scapegoats. And this is where I kind of go back, well, I did in the book, but I, it's, you know, it's so important to remind people for me, the inspiration is, of course, René Girard and everything he wrote. And this is what I read and heard you know, when I was an adolescent. And of course, when you read Girard on Oedipus especially, um, you'd learn so much about how you know, so, societies taken by violence and mimetic desires need to channel this violence on a scapegoat. And how the scapegoat, what are the attributes of the scapegoat? Um, and I want to ask my audience, my chorus, you know, what do you think is the perfect scapegoat? And that's, this is where we learn that the scapegoat, you know, needs to be, does it need to resemble you to be um, credible or actually be different enough to be able to externalize your sins? Um, what do you do with the scapegoat? So we have a whole conversation about scapegoat and deconstructing what scapegoat means. But as you may have seen in the paper, of course, what interests me is to point to to the fact that, um, hey, there, is, there are two fundamental questions with scapegoating. One is, when did it really start? And this is where, you know, my kind of um, uh, engagement with Oedipus, you know, leads me, it's not, it's a story that, um, you know, most people don't know. I'm not talking about classicists, but out there, even people fascinated by mythology forget the fact that it's not this weirdo thing where there, poor Oedipus, you know, had this curse. No, of course not. It all comes from the past. His father, Elias, actually, you know, basically wanted to have sex with his half brother. He'd been adopted by Pax. What a wonderful cyclope. And what does he do in exchange? Lead, lead Chrysippus to commit suicide. 
and, and that's not very nice. And the curse comes from there. And then you start thinking, ha, huh, you know, okay. So, well, okay, poor Oedipus wasn't guilty, but you could kind of say, well, he had an inheritance, you know, and maybe he didn't really investigate his past and maybe he should have known. And you start thinking about responsibility and guilt and shame and how history is always about setting the guide. There's always cause and effect. A leads to B, leads to A, leads to B. Where do you, where do you look for this moment? And of course, if you look at every conflict, there's always someone who said, no, it started with A. And the, uh, no, no, it started with B before that, B with A. So just let's start thinking about the fact that uh, there's always an upstream in the river of time. And the second question is, of course, where does it end? Because in the end, of course, Oedipus is redeemed by no other than Theseus, who killed all sacrifice. So what do we do with that? I ask my audience. Okay, so that's theme one. I know that um, we want to end very soon. So I, I'm going to go really quickly in the other themes because I want to hear what your reaction. Um, so theme two um, is, is, is a theme very close to my heart in praise of ambivalence. Now, that theme is a reaction to, you know, the extreme polarization we're seeing in politics today, so-called mass affective polarization. Uh, and I don't need to, to expand on this, but this is what plagues our society today. And my take on this, you know, goes back to another stories that I think, you know, most people who loves and love and adore Ulysses don't grapple with. And this is the one you will know about, to, about um, Ulysses not wanting to go to the Trojan Wars and old Palmides coming to him and saying, please, please come. Ulysses pretending to be crazy and putting salt on his fields. Palmides getting him to uh, prove that he's showed that he's not crazy by putting baby Telemachy in front of the horses and the rest is history. Um, and, but the point about the story for my audience that I engage with is, hey guys, this was the great hero, right? Cunning and warlike and courageous, every quality. Well, the guy was damn ambivalent. He was maybe heroically ambivalent, but he was as much wanting to stay home with wife and baby than going to be famous for the rest of eternity, you know, in Troy. And so I've used, you know, you, my dear Ulysses to convey the beauty and the importance of the politics of ambivalence. And indeed, the fact that, you know, most people are ambivalent between cooperation and control. You know, most people understand that, you know, you need to work with your neighbors, but, all, but they want to be in control of their little life. Don't we all want to do that, be in control? And so in a way, I mean, maybe this is personal psychotherapy, but I do say me ambivalent, well, yes and no. And yeah, ambivalence is often thought as a pathology. You're schizophrenic. You can't make up your mind. You know, you're, you're the dark and the bright side. Um, but of course, ambivalence is also, you know, the, what... Um, the hybrid um, post-colonial subject is also all about vis-a-vis -vis the former colonizer. Um, and, and there is a beauty to ambivalence because ambivalence is about acknowledging complexity, uh, being open to many arguments. Um, and it's about being capable of having that conversation because you're not fixed in your beliefs, right? So, um, so it's about dealing with complexity, in fact. And in fact, we're all ambivalent. And this is what a lot of social psychology show us. And I've kind of been working a lot on this stuff. And, um, and indeed, don't we want societies that acknowledge this, that tragedies are the struggle between right and right, and that democracy is a political system for people who are not sure that they are right. Um, and so when we come back to our Ulysses, you know, the question for me is, can we move from heroic to day-to-day -day ambivalence? Uh, and what about the EU, will Charles skip? And indeed, um, what I call the Machiavelli trap, the idea that um, in politics, maybe there are all sorts of dynamics, including voting, that are black and white, and that force us as ambivalent beings to become polarized and go to one extreme. And my question is, how do we tap back into our ambivalent Ulysses um, to create processes and ways of voting, that are actually um, uh, reflective of this ambivalent. And this citizens assembly or this alternative voting, these are ways of actually 
tapping back into our ambivalence. So, and, and so I want to ask my audience, my chorus, you know, about that um, through Ulysses. And of course, by the way, if Iphigenia also was ambivalent, um, as we know, she, changed, she famously changed her mind so many times. So let's use her, but that for good reasons. So theme three is about hubris, because of course, you know, if you're in Britain, we always hear about you know, Johnson's nemesis, you know, there was so much hubris, and hubris is always used negatively, and for good reasons. You know, you're overconfident, and with your hubris, you, t you don't only bear the risk yourself, but you have your whole society have to force to follow you in this hubris. And of course, when we look at all the heroes, or the characters rather, that display hubris in Greek mythology, the question I want to ask my audience is, well, how do we really feel about hubris? You know, yeah, you know, Prometheus stole the fire, but he did it for us, and he was punished hard, but then eventually saved, whereas Tantalus was never saved, and he did some pretty naughty things. You know, you don't give your kids to eat to the gods uh, with no consequence, but he was, of course, uh, but what about Icarus? You know, was it so bad to aim for the sun? Um, and indeed, Obviously, you know, when we think of Sisyphus, we cannot help but think of Albert Camus and the myth of Sisyphus and this everlasting struggle that you need to own. And his last, obviously, wonderful sentence, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Now, of course, in France, if you say, il faut imaginer Sisyphereux, everyone knows what you're thinking, which is why I did write a, a piece in Le Monde, um, saying, il faut imaginer un Brexit heureux, with this kind of Sisyphean task. Can we, can we own it? Who will own it? Um, so what do we do with hubris? And, and of course, the ultimate, you know, for, for us women, you know, the ultimate heroine of hubris is, of course, our dear Arachne, uh, who may have been punished for demonstrating on her weaving that the, the deeds of the gods raping all the girls, but hey, weren't weren't we glad that this web of resistance, you know, continues to inspire us today as she became the godmother of me too. Her hubris, she paid for it, but benefited us all, didn't it? So again, I want my audience to engage with hubris and ask what is good and bad hubris? And finally, the last theme is about unions, going back to what I you know, my original work in, in um, what is a political union. And I, there I'm inspired by two wonderful mythical women, obviously. Uh, why was Helen the most beautiful and brilliant women in the world? We always forget the second part. And remembered as such. And of course, I want everyone to engage with the fact that, hey, you know, maybe her secret is her hybridity. The daughter of Leta and, and Zeus as a swan, weirdo stuff, okay? But this is, isn't that what unions are about? You can be uh, blue and pink and, or neither or both. And in Ireland, you can be British or Irish or neither or both. And in Europe, you can be European or national or neither or both. You can be cosmopolitan and national too, maybe. Can we, and of course, hybridity is also about a frontier zone, cosmopolitan cities, all of these liminal spaces um, that, you know, we all understand and circularity. And so, so if, I, if we keep the beauty of hybridity in mind, then what do we do with Europe? And how is Europe living up to the beauty of hybridity? Because as we know from Edith Hall and so many others, you know, the Greeks, of course, define themselves by inventing the barbarian the other, the Asian other, and yet Europa, wasn't she an Asian princess from Lebanon who came, who was abducted by Zeus? Don't we see so many ubiquitous image? And who knows yet, who knows that she was brown and she kind of came from elsewhere outside Europe? And indeed, the question I want to ask my audience is, you know, isn't that a better Europe, a Christian Europe? a Christian spirit that comes from outside Europe, that is other, that lands in the periphery in Crete, isn't the core of Europe its periphery. 
um, isn't that a much better image than Christian Europe? Isn't that the Europe we should want to build with our kids? Um, and that's a Europe that's always in movement, that comes from elsewhere. So I want to use, you know, the myth of Europa very differently from a lot of what we see in all these cartoons and drawings of Europe on her bowl. What is behind that? And how do you marry her with the hybridity of Ellen? So that's where I want to leave us today. And, um, and, and indeed, us as scholars, but also in, in our way of engaging a bigger audience. Thank you.